All right, in 2 Timothy now, I told you these things for me are prophetic. They're talking about things that can apply at any time. But they also have to do with uh, the last days. And you find that by the time you get over to first or 2 Timothy chapter number 3. <clears throat> so when I teach this, I have taught already and am teaching that in 2 Timothy 2 and 3, you see a precursor to what we'll call the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church means the catching away. We understand, and I always try my best for those of you that are new to listen today, for you to understand that oftentimes a preacher or pastor will say the word second coming, and what he means by that is the rapture. But the second coming and the rapture of the church are two entirely different things. The rapture of the church or the catching away is when the Lord comes, 1 Corinthians 15 or 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, and so shall we ever be the Lord. The Lord says he comes in the clouds, and behold, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. So what it is, is the rapture is, is the church, those dead in Christ and those that are alive when he comes, alive and remain, will be caught up to meet him. Now, the second coming of Christ, which you're hearing a lot about right now, you know, most of you are glued to your television sets and uh, you're glued to your internet and you're checking your websites and who's doing what and, and so on and so forth. And you're hearing a lot of people interjecting second coming and using the book of Revelation on a regular basis to take that book of Revelation and, and try to turn that into these are the plagues and the earthquakes are increasing and the volcanoes are increasing. Matthew chapter number 24 and we're seeing things that are happening here. Those are second coming events that take place. If you don't do what he just said in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, he says this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you've got your Bible open, look in verse 15. This is just teaching. Study. To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you know what you do? You put the church in the tribulation period. You know what you do? You wind up taking promises to the nation of Israel and applying them to the church today. Here's a basic dispensational thing for you to understand. Don't get afraid by the word. Dispensation just simply means a dispensing of time and what God's attribute is during that particular time. I'll grant you God's grace is there during every dispensation, every time period, but there's some things that are different. But let me just say this to you so that you might understand. First of all, who's talking? Is it God? Is it the devil? Is it a person? Second of all, who are they talking to? Is it the Jew? Is it the Gentile? Is it the church? I can't apply Jewish things to the church. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, I can't apply uns things to unsaved people, Gentiles, or unsaved Jews to the church. You say, why? I'm the church, the body of Christ. Paul wrote 13 books. Those books apply to the church age. That's the glasses that you use to use to view the entire body. I mean, excuse me, the entire Bible. So if you don't do that and you listen to a lot of these pundits that are on television today and some of them are even newscasters and some of them are preachers or wannabe pastors or whatever it might be, uh, they're sending out all kind of letters and notes and cards. They've got a platform now where they can just talk about things and interject things because everybody has a microphone nowadays. And so what you begin to see is, is things that pop up sometimes that nobody else has ever heard about and if you don't rightly divide your Bible, you can be badly deceived, which he's going to warn you about in a second. And by the way, this is going on during the days of the Apostle Paul, and he's warning about a false teaching about the resurrection, teaching that the resurrection had already taken place, and so there was no hope for the people that were there. Well, if you don't rightly divide your Bible, you know what will happen? You'll get to look into this thing and say, well, this must be the plague over there in the book of Revelation. No, it's not the plague in the book of Revelation. You say, how do you know? Because I'm still here. You say, oh, so you think you're going to be gone. You're going to die first? No, I think that Jesus Christ is either going to come, whether by death or rapture. I know I'm not going to be in the tribulation period. I'm not going to be there in the tribulation period. The church goes out before that time. Does that not mean that we'll have tribulation? Does that not mean we'll have persecution? Does that not mean we'll have difficulty? No, it doesn't mean you won't have those things at all. You're guaranteed those things. As a matter of fact, He gives you a reward for having those things. If you suffer, He says over in 2 Timothy, where we just were, verse number 12, go back and read it. If you suffer, you shall also reign with Christ, indicating you're going to suffer as a Christian no matter what the time frame is. 
I heard a friend of mine use an illustration. I've used it a number of times. I don't know where he got it from, but it's a great illustration. I'm positive during the day of Hitler rising to, uh, to the top and taking over country after country after country and persecuting the Jews and throwing them in ovens and doing ungodly experiments on them and, and eradicating them and eliminating them. What a great time to say you're in the tribulation. What a great time during the pandemic of 1917, 1918, when I think the number is somewhere between 50 and 100 million died, but 7 million died in the United States. Well, that, what a great time to say, well, that must be the plague. That must be the thing that was going on. What a great time after the World War took place in World War II and you go through an economic depression in the United States. That was worldwide too. But what a great time to say that. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, you take events that are occurring. I'll grant you... This is an, un, uh, 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 an event that none of us have ever been through before. I doubt there's anybody much alive nowadays that was alive in 1917 and 1918. Some of them were alive during the Depression. But for most of us, we've never experienced something like this. Not that it was worldwide. We had an economic downturn in 2008, but it didn't really affect us the way that this has affected us. We've had uh, some, some cataclysmic crashes of the real estate market and, and uh, the, what do they call the dot-com bubble blew up and, and those kind of things. But, uh, but, but this is not even a, a war in the sense of a human against a human. This is a microscopic bug that nobody's ever been there. Now, I'm sure many of you probably have already found it in the Bible, in a Bible code, or if you read the Bible this way or that way or whatever, you can probably find something in there about it. But it's not the tribulation. So when you're reading your Bible and studying your Bible, you want to be familiar with the Pauline epistles because if I read that in 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, he tells me, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with prayer. But in the Old Testament, he tells me I can't eat things that uh, don't that are that are don't have uh, fins and scales. Now, which is it? Well, it's the one that applies to me under the Apostle Paul. The same thing goes for his gospel, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. What is that gospel? How that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, was buried and raised again the third day according to Scripture. You say, yeah, but in Acts chapter number 2, verse 38, there were Jews gathered there. Paul had not even been called yet. The mystery had not been revealed of Jew and Gentile in one body. The mystery of Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory. None of that was revealed. What's Peter preaching? He only adds to that thing, you shall receive the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized. Well, you and I know you don't have to be baptized for salvation. Well, but preacher, you know, a lot of people preach that because it's the gospel. No, that's not the gospel for you. You can get baptized all day long. If you don't believe the death, the burial, and the resurrection, well, that's just a preconceived notion. Peter never preaches it. Until they have a council over in Acts 15, and then Peter says, guys, we believe what Paul believes. And then Peter passes off the scene, and the apostle Paul comes in, and that's what will be here until the rapture. And I'm not going to get into an argument there. After the rapture takes place, it will go back to how it was before when Peter was preaching, repent, and be baptized. Look, if you will, please, back there in 2 Timothy in your Bible. No, I'm giving you a lot of information, but it's important. It's imperative. I, the people talk about the Bible being old and old-fashioned, and, and the Bible doesn't make any difference, preacher, and who really knows about the Bible? It's so old. It's so out of date and all that. Boy, that's pretty update to me. Up, uh, that's pretty updated to me. That's right on line with your headlines if you want to go by it. You say, what? If you don't rightly divide your Bible, you think the church is going to go through the tribulation. You think you're going to get the mark of the beast. I've had a number of emails. I don't know what the number is. I'm not all that popular, but I have a number of emails that have come in, you know, and uh, this is it, and the mark of the beast is going to be here, and this is how this is the vehicle is going to be used to get the mark of the beast, and, and you're going to have the mark of the beast, and don't take the mark of the beast, and don't take this, or it'll have the mark of the beast in it, and, and don't do this. It's the mark of the beast and the mark of the beast. I don't even worry about that stuff. I don't even respond to it anymore. You say, why? Because I believe what the Bible says, rightly divided. I'm going to be caught up before the beast shows up to give me the mark. Now, you want to get a bunch of people jacked up about whether or not taking an inoculation is going to be the mark of the beast or whether or not a tattoo is going to be the mark of the beast or if you want to get into the transhuman stuff and mix uh, uh, iron and clay mixed together and make that iron as opposed to making it metallic, I mean, as opposed to making it what the Bible teaches in Daniel 2, that that's the fallen angels and the demonic spirits that are here during the tribulation. If you want to turn that into somebody's uh, leg replacement, an amputee's leg replacement, and say, well, that's so he means iron and clay there. Well, then go ahead, but you missed the whole thing. That's during the tribulation period. That's Genesis 6 repeated again. That's history all over again. 
You say, Preacher, that's a little too wild for me. Well, you're in a pretty wild time, aren't you? I've heard for years now, going all the way back to Y2K, for years and years and years, you know, you better get your uh, guns ready, you better get some hidden some money, buy some gold, get some silver, get some platinum, uh, that's going to be how you trade it, get you some precious stones and stuff, and, and then go buy these big uh, five-gallon buckets of food, and, and put up some corn, and some rice, and some beans, and things like that, because in 2000, at that night, on New Year's night, when the calendar rolls over, the computers don't know how to read it, and the whole thing's going to crash the economy is going to come down and we're going to be set back to the 1800s. And 2000 came and went and it wasn't even a glitch. And nothing happened except a bunch of people wound up with a bunch of spare food in their basement and a bunch of preparations for things that never even took place. You're 20 years past that. And here we are, 20 years out there, and people are telling me for the last 20 years, get ready, Russia's going to invade. Get ready, China's going to invade. Get ready, you're going to have Red Dawn. Get ready, there's going to be uh, 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 the uh, chemtrails are going to spray you and turn on 5G, and it's going to irradiate your body, and, and they're going to drop you like flies, and, and you need to do this, and you know, put foil in your house, and put it over your roof, and, and turn off your GPS, and turn off your cell phone. They're tracking you and all that. They didn't just start saying that since this happened. They've been saying it for years. The preacher have been getting people ready for to stay here on this earth. That's not my job as a preacher. It's to prepare you for leaving this earth. Now we're not going to be like that stupid cult, you know, they're all of them dressed up in Nike tennis shoes and black outfits and purple grapes or something or another, and they all went there, drank the juice and said they were catching a spaceship and getting out of here. Or like idiot down there in uh, Guyana that went down there, Jim Jones, and had a bunch of people drink the Kool-Aid. And by the way, you study that, you'll find out they found a bunch of people down there that were shot in the back of the head that wouldn't drink the Kool-Aid and things like that. They've been talking end time prophecies for years. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, you know what you're thinking? You're thinking, well, this must be it. You know what I know? I know not a single person that I've read after ever thought that the end would come with a bug. It's always been some army invading. It's always been justification for the right to bear arms and all that. I'd like for you to see you try that over in China or in Japan or maybe Saudi Arabia or some other country. You're chirping about it so much over here. Well, you know, the first step to them taking your guns is, is they're keeping you from going to church. Do you ever think about your statement you just made? I'll get back to this here in just a second. Do you ever think about the statement you just made? They're keeping you from going to church, so they're coming after your guns. Well, preacher, that's they're taking your rights away. Okay, let me ask you this. What about the restaurants? What about the schools? What about the factories? What about big business in these big high-rise buildings and stuff like that? What about uh, sporting events? You say, well, this is what they're going to do. I, I don't know why everybody thinks it's just affecting the church. That's kind of a singular way of looking at things. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, and this goes for preachers too, and I don't mean any disrespect by this. The Lord promised you trouble, trials, and tribulation, and pestilence is upon us as a nation. Well, at least it's on some people. Uh, It's hitting some people and not hitting other people's, which by some people's hypothesis, that proves the whole thing is a hoax. And then you have one group of doctors that says it is and one group of doctors that says it isn't. You say, what's your opinion about it? I err on the side of just being cautious, and I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak to it. I'm not working in the emergency rooms where some of our nurses are working. I'm not working in the front lines with the police and with the rescue and fire and some of the military people. I can't speak to those things. I'm not seeing what they're seeing. I'm saying that. They're telling me to be cautious. I have an unusual set of circumstances with the situation I have at home. Uh, because for my wife to catch it, whether, whatever it is, it, it could be deadly to her. You say, well, you know, you just have to trust the Lord. Well, you trust the Lord with your wife, okay? How about trust the Lord with your marriage, okay? I'm supposed to try to protect her. I'm supposed to try to watch out for her. I had a fellow ask me, he said, "Uh, where's your wife in the services? I said, where everybody else is. I got three guys here running cameras and playing a piano and singing a song. And if I could do it without them being here, I'd do that too. You say, why? Well, why should they get, they get exposed and then they wind up getting exposed and, uh, and exposing their families? I don't know what's going on in their families. I don't have any problems at all with somebody saying, I'm not coming. I remember years ago, a lot of years ago now, we had a hurricane coming this way and the mayor came on and the sheriff came on and said, could you please stay off the streets and you can't cross the bridges. We're all connected here by by bridges and stuff. We have a lot of people that travel a great distance. 
And so uh, I made the decision to close the, the church doors. I had a, an individual that called me and left me a very, very nasty message. It was an individual that he never came, but now that you're going to have a hurricane, he was going to come in the hurricane, which is really odd to me. He doesn't come any other time, but now we're having a hurricane. He's going to show how spiritual and what a man he is to, to brave the, the winds and all that kind of stuff. And so he left me a really nasty message and said he wouldn't be coming back to church anymore because I closed the doors during a hurricane. I was asked to close the doors by the governmental officials. You say, well, did you close it because of them? No, I closed it because I didn't want our folks having to drive across bridges and stuff. You say, why? Because they shut the bridges down here when the, when the uh, wind gets up to 40 miles an hour. And so what happens if somebody's here and they got to drive back down south or they got to drive back to Lake City or they got to drive to Fernandina or they got to drive to Orlando? They got to cross a bridge. And they say, well, the bridge is closed. What do I do? Endanger the whole family? We well, just have to trust God. Okay, well, you trust the Lord with that. I'm going to do my best to use my head for something besides a hat rack. Uh, you want to endanger people with your thought or your idea for your reputation, then go ahead. But I want to say this, be careful, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to understand that you may not have to suffer the repercussions of a decision you help somebody else to make. You do what God tells you to do, individually, personally. It's not a herd mentality. And just because this place is doing it doesn't mean it's right for you to do it. And be thinking along those lines. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let me get back to doctrinal issues here before I run out of Sunday school time. Uh, notice what he says in that passage. He comes down there and he starts talking about the two individuals there that are teaching uh, false teachings and stuff. Now, I've given you all the, uh, uh, the, the passages there on false teachers and false preachers. And you're going to see more and more of that. I'll show you that later when we get in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll show you that in 2 Timothy 4. I'll show you that in normal uh, other parallel passages that shows you one of the signs that you're in the latter days before the rapture is more and more and more false teaching begins to show up. One of the things that begins to occur is the old uh, conservative way of doing things has to change. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a whole lot more than just the internet. It has to do with doctrinal teaching. Why do you have to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified anymore? Why do you preach that sin is still the killer and the problem that all men have in common? Oh, why don't you get the message from the graveyard? What is that? That's a message you get today from the empty tomb that's in the graveyard and preaching those things. Nowadays, the messages have become to be about the people, the people, the people, the people. Why, that's Laodicea, the rights of the people. What about the people? Guess what's happening? Now we have this thing going on in the United States. By the way, it's in a, I don't remember what the number is now. Originally it was like 153 and now it's 170 something. Don't quote me on the number, whatever the number of nations. It's across the board. A lot of people have got this thing that's going on, whatever it is. It's not real. It's the, the government in the United States is deceiving the entire world and so is China and everybody else that has it. But, but whatever it is, the, 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 the panic is striking everybody and so guess what happens it's i'm hearing preachers that are now making it about you instead of about hey why don't you get ready if it is the end be it ready to meet jesus have you prepared people that are around you to die does your family know where you're going when you die if you have to be like someone here big john here lost his dad here just a few days ago you say what well the doctor's report said that it was the virus now, if you want to tangle up with him and say, well, we really don't believe that, you're messing with somebody else's statistics that didn't affect you personally. Well, you know, they, they doctored this and doctored that, and he must have had this and he must have had that, and then they just chalked it up to this. See, it fits your theory, but that doesn't work for him. He lost his dad younger than I am. What do you do with that? You better be careful about giving people advice. You better be careful if you're not a doctor about telling people what you think they ought to do with something like this. What if they die from you? Telling them something like that. What if you decide to tell somebody to get together or not? And you make that decision and you don't have to suffer the repercussions. You don't have to know that. I heard a fellow the other day telling so-and-so you should take such-and-such and, such and this and that and the other. And uh, he called me and said, well, what do you think about this? I said, well, I don't know, brother. I'm not a doctor. You should call a doctor. He goes, well, I had doctors. They don't know nothing anyway. I said, brother, do you realize if you just told that person to take what you told them to take and they take it and they're taking another medicine, did you realize that the combination of those two things could cause instantaneous death? The phone went just like that. 
He said, well, 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 I said, well, what I'm saying is, is why did you have to tell the person that? Why wouldn't you say, consult your doctor? You know, you just said doctors don't know anything. Okay, good. They've been telling you for years preachers don't know anything. How's that feel? Doctors get trained in a special thing, but here's the deal. They tell you to do whatever, and then you can decide what you want to do. And the big hoopla nowadays about whether or not they are or are not going to create a vaccine, a flu vaccine, or a COVID-19 <coughs> pardon me, uh, uh, vaccine, or whether or not they're going to create a coronavirus vaccine. I don't know. Maybe some of you remember the days. I remember the days of polio vaccinations. My mom and dad didn't hesitate at all. You say, why? They'd seen people with polio. They'd seen people affected with that virus. So I would never take that. Okay, all right, fine, that's good for you. Be careful, though, about telling people not to take it because you may not be the one that comes down with it. You may have already been inoculated with the sugar cube or with the injection. You forget all about that, measles and mumps and all the other kind of stuff. You know, well, it's see, see, it fits into what you want it to be instead of what it could be for them individually. You should go visit their kid in the hospital when they wind up taking your advice because why? Well, all your kids are already taken care of. They're already grown past the age where they could get it. And so now you're going to ride them into the dirt because you just have a rebellious nature about you. I'm just suggesting to you to be careful, ladies and gentlemen. The pulpit is to preach about Jesus Christ and Him crucified and things to get you ready for eternity. It's not to make you a medical expert or a dietary expert or a marriage expert or a financial expert. You're supposed to be an expert in the Bible. The, the, the Bible and the virus. What, 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 what do I, that's not a medical book for me. Well, the Bible says, you know, if I go into the Old Testament and I take the things that they were given the Old Testament saints over there, that then I can be healed by that. And if I get a little myrrh and get a little aloe and I get a little this and it gives me that. You don't know that. You're not a chemist. You're not a scientist. That stuff winds up degrading your testimony. Why do you have to say that? Why can't you just say, I don't know, ask your doctor and then make a decision. Pray over it. Don't ask me, pray. Ask God what He thinks. But don't endanger your life or the life of somebody else because you're interested in putting forth what you want to put forth. See, everybody has a platform nowadays. Everybody has a way to get out their information. And you get blinders on and then all they're going to do is is present you evidence that supports their position. And they're not going to listen to anybody else. Uh, You have a preacher that disagrees with you. Okay, good. He has a right to disagree with you. Move on. My responsibility is right here, right now. So what am I supposed to do? Do my best to take care of them, but I never take away their right to choose. They can listen to me and think I'm full of prunes, and probably am sometimes. Now notice what he says here in in the passage. I hope I'm not going too fast for you. Verse 21, he's talking about a grace house. uh, Verse 20, uh, the vessels of gold and silver and wood and earth. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified meat for the master of youth. And then he says, flee you full of us and follow righteousness and all that. The purging comes first. What is that? That's simply putting off the old man and putting on the new. Uh, Come to Ephesians chapter number 4. Put off the old man and put on the new. A purging process is, it's not just getting rid of a bunch of stuff. It's filling up yourself with the right stuff. Putting off the old man, the things that the old man likes to do. That's found in Galatians chapter number 5. Make no mistake about it, after you got saved, you can still do the same thing in your flesh that you did before you got saved, with the exception of you can't go to hell. But don't ever make any mistake that you still have two natures. I guess the psychological term for that, and I'm not a doctor, would be uh, you're schizophrenic. You have the old man and you have the new man. And therefore the Lord tells you, put off the old man, but then He gives you further instruction to put on the new man. And then He gives you some things to think about in Philippians chapter number 4 to help you think the way that the new man is supposed to think. Look, if you will, in Ephesians 4. Look at verse number, oh, pick it up, 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Jump all the way down and be, uh, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Why? Because your mind is where things uh, uh, transcend. That's the engine. Verse number 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, because you put on the new man, then he gives you some things that you're supposed to get rid of. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, your fight is against now that you're saved. There's two battlegrounds that you're going to have. Now that you're saved, as a result of being saved, you have another mind in you. And that mind is the mind of the new man. The Lord said, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. But it's not an automatic switch. It's available to you, but you have to avail yourself of it. You have to put that new man on and you have to make your old man function with a new boss in the chair, in the captain's chair. If you don't learn that principle, you will always be up and down on your Christian life. You'll go back and forth between the old man, the new man, the old man, the new man. Well, preacher, do you have that down pal? Absolutely not. That's why I need church. That's why I need the Bible. That's why I need prayer. That's why I need preaching. That's why I need the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You say, why? Because it's not natural for the old man to think like the new man. You have to make an effort. And we make an effort everywhere else in a promotional process when it comes to what you're doing as far as your work is concerned. You have to study to think the way the corporation or the institution thinks so that you can pass the test. If you're in school, you have to learn what the teacher's trying to teach you in order to be able to pass the test. Well, being a Christian, being saved and being a Christian are two entirely different things. Being saved is as simple as you admitting you're a sinner, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and confessing Him as your Savior. I'm not talking lordship salvation. I'm not talking about if Jesus Christ isn't Lord of all, He isn't Lord at all. Let me say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. There is no one that has ever accomplished that with the exception of Jesus Christ Himself. The Apostle Paul says in Acts chapter number 27, he's coming through, excuse me, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul says this, he is 27 years after he's saved. The greatest Christian, the greatest Christian saved preacher that ever walked the face of this earth. You know what he says? The things I should do, that would be the new man, I don't do. And the things I shouldn't, that would be the old man, those things I do. You know what he says? O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of my death? For I know that in me that is in my flesh, 27 years after I've been saved, dwelleth no good thing. You know what you have to do? This is the problem with lazy Christians nowadays. I, I know we're in a time of, of great turmoil and great fear and, and panic and I realize people are looking for answers but uh, allow me just a little bit of liberty this morning because I've tried my best to be very kind to you. But one of the problems we have today is lazy Christians that won't read, won't study, won't pray but more importantly won't practice what God tells you to practice. Uh, Listen, I I probably wasn't the greatest athlete in the world, but I managed to play a little bit of ball along the way. And you know what? I learned two things. Number one, if I didn't go to practice, I didn't play. And number two, my weaknesses in whatever sport I was playing never got any better until I learned to practice the new way. But when it comes to Christianity, we think it's like being saved. I'm saying you get saved because that's what He does. But if you want to be a Christian, it requires some sweat. It requires some effort. Not works to show you're saved, not works to get saved, but working to put on a mind like Christ. What would Lord Jesus Christ do right now? you got a bunch of Christians, a bunch of preachers, a bunch of, oh Lord, care us not that we perish and the Lord's taking a nap. He cares about you. He loves you. But you know what? He gets up and He said, where's your faith? you got to have your faith stretched out. What's God doing? I don't know. I wrote that in an email here recently. I don't know, but I know He knows. So my faith is in Him right now. My faith is in what? Are you listening to me? My faith is in whatever He has planned. He's got this. But He doesn't have to stop and tell me what's going on. I had a friend of mine tell me, he said, you know something, there's one thing uh, in the military and one thing maybe even being uh, on a ship or whatever that admirals don't go all the way down to the sailors that are mopping the deck and tell them about what's going on up there as far as the whole fleet is concerned or as far as their war or battle group is concerned. All he wants to know is, is that guy mopping the floor when it needs to be clean when the attack comes. Jesus Christ doesn't have to tell us everything that's going on so that we then come out and announce it. If we did, we'd probably be proud as a peacock, pun intended, to run out and say, I've got the answer. I can tell you what this is. Well, I can't tell you what it is. And people smarter than me can't tell you what it is. But there's a lot of speculation going on. Where's your faith? I don't know what it is. God's got it. 
He'll give me enough faith today to get through it. What are you going to do tomorrow? I'll wait till tomorrow. I like what Martin Luther said when they came to him and said, uh, Mr. Luther, what would you do if you knew Jesus was coming tomorrow? You know what he said? It's profound. You know what he said? He said, I'd plow my taters. I think he said potatoes, but I'm making them from the south. He said, I'd plow my potatoes. Plow your potatoes? He said, yeah, I would do what I've been doing. I, nothing would change because I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, nowadays we've got things going on and people are speculating and people are guessing and they don't have any concept of what's going on. But, but, but we have in this day lazy Christians that because they haven't worked on their relationship with the Lord, they're in the boat wringing their hands and sweat's priming off their brow and they're like, oh Lord, wh- wh- what are we going to do? Don't, don't you care if we perish? Well, if you die, it's precious in the sight of the Lord, the death of His saints. That doesn't mean you endanger people. I've been on one or two dangerous calls in my life. When I, I happened to get one of those calls, I didn't stop and tell everybody to pause a minute. Let me run by the house and pick up my wife and bring her to a bad situation and expose her to the possibility of, of getting in a situation she wasn't trained for and, and uh, divide my attention from where it should be to something like that. I'm not going to unnecessarily expose her to something that way. I don't have to do that to prove my spirituality, how spiritual I am. A uh, fellow said to me, he said, I've noticed you quit traveling. They ask us to quit traveling. Well, you just got to trust God. Okay, we'll hop on a plane and go. But I have another responsibility here. I'm not going to be out of place when folks here need what's going on to go on here. It's not a matter of those things. I love going. I love being able to go other places and do other things like that. But now that's for me. You do whatever the Lord tells you to do. I respect your independence. But be careful to think that your independence entitles you to lead people astray. In these last days, you know what he says to you? He said, you've got to put off concerning the former conversation. I'm about to run out of time. Come, if you will, please, quickly to uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Come to Philippians. Philippians. And come, if you will, please, to uh, verse number, chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. Now, this might sting just a little bit, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck or be obnoxious when I say it or arrogant. But I want to show you what the mind of Christ is. And, and if it matches up then with your way of ministering as a Christian during this time, I, I preached a few weeks ago about how to help others in this time instead of making it about you. You know, make them some cookies or whatever. Might be their last meal. I don't know. Uh, uh, Call them up. Talk to them. Send them a letter. uh, Do something. And you can do it and still remain within the guidelines and those kind of things. But what we've done is, is turned it into an opportunity to make it about us. And we're the only ones flying the flag. I'm not hearing many people in the United States talking about the, the effect of this thing in other countries. You got believers all around the world that are being affected as much or more than you and I are being affected. You're just hearing about it here, and it's all because it's focusing on us. Look, if you will, please, let me show you the mind of Christ in Philippians 2, and then we'll take a short break here. Notice what he says. Look not every man, verse number 4. I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, verse number 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than himself, than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now you know what he just said? The mind of Christ is, I made myself of no reputation. I humbled myself and became obedient to death. You know, one of the best ways to have a, a victorious Christian life is to already be dead. Paul said, I die daily. Paul said, it's important for me to understand I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm crucified with Christ. I have to accept that promise. And on the other side, guess what? That old flesh comes up on a regular basis and bothers me. You know what he said? If a man therefore, in 2 Timothy chapter number uh, 3, where we're at, 2, excuse me, where we're at, he said, if a man therefore will purge himself from these. So that has to do with your old nature and your old ways, and it also has to do with the teachers that are teaching contrary to what the book says. And you won't know what that is if you don't study to show yourself approved. And you say, well, preacher, you can't be dogmatic about it. No, I can't be, but the Bible can be. 
And so if you learn to take the Bible during a time of a storm and realize, okay, well, I've got to do what the Bible says, whether it's in time of storm, time of Noah's flood, time of great pandemic, a time of world war, a time of uh, a famine or a time of feasting, a time of whatever. Ecclesiastes 3 is where I'm quoting from. There's a time and a season for everything under the sun. A time to be born and a time to die and a time to eat and a time to, to be hungry and a, a time to be clothed and a time to be naked and a time for this and a time for this and a time for this and a time for this. I don't know what time it is for you, but I know this. When you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you know what He's going to judge you on? What did you do for Him? Not what age were you in or what took place. I got a funny phone call yesterday. I mean, we made it funny. It was not, it's not really funny, but you know how you know uh, us older people have been accused of making the comments or making the statements on a regular basis of, you know, well, I walked uh, five miles in the snow with holes in my shoes uphill the whole way, and, you know, by the time I got out of school, I had to walk back uphill to go back home, and we've always made it, you know, I women, are, you know, I carried you for nine months before you were born, and, and that kind of thing, and I told this young lady that I was talking to who was trying to make wedding plans and stuff, I said, just think about this, if the Lord tarries, you'll be able to tell your kids and grandkids, uh, we got married in a pandemic. And you'll be able to, you know, well, we had to get married in a pandemic and we couldn't have more than 10 people gathered. And I know the rules changed to 50 and, and or 50 people. And, and so because of that, we had to social distance, you know, except for me and my husband. I guess you've got to keep six foot apart there with that. And so we kind of had a laugh about it and a little bit of a joke about it. You say, well, why would you joke about something so serious? Well, ladies and gentlemen, because one day when the Lord either comes by death or rapture, all that's going to matter is, is what did you do for Him? He's not going to look around and take into consideration what was happening in the world and the day that was there or the storm you were in when you were in the boat saying, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And the Lord's like, well, you're with me. So how can you perish? If you're saved, you'll never die. Well, let me rephrase. Your soul won't, but your flesh can still die today. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless your word. Be with us in the upcoming uh, resurrection service. Thank you, Lord, for the folks that are tuned in and watching. I pray that you'll be with us now. We'd ask these things in your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.